Hello everyone and welcome to the second round of action at the Tadasil Chess Tournament in Wijkanze, the Netherlands. Today we had another exciting round where a lot of the established elite met some of the up and coming prodigies. For example, this game here between Anish Giri and Good Cash. We also had the game between world champion Magnus Carlsen and Vincent Keimer and many other exciting games. So let's have a look at what happened today. So Anish with the white pieces, he played against Good Cash. Good Cash had a very tough first round. He lost with the white piece against Ding. And I'm sure that my good friend Anish wanted to take advantage of that and try to pound on him even more. So Anish opened the game with 1d4 and it's always interesting to see what Anish has prepared. He's one of the best prepared players in the world. So let's see what he came up with. Gukesh responded with c4, uh, sorry, knight of 6, c4, e6. So he's intending to play the Nimza Indian defense in case of knight of c3. So Anish decides to sidestep that with the move knight of 3, d5 and knight c3. Here black has a lot of options. But Gukesh chose the move bishop d4 to Raghu's in defense. All right, and here Anish chose the move bishop g5. Other options are queen a4 check. This does not win a piece. Black is forced to play knight c6, and white argues that the knight is slightly misplaced here because black would like to play c5 in some variations. <clears throat> All right, but bishop g5 by Anish, putting pressure on the knight right away. Gukesh plays h6, and Anish decides to trade his bishop for the knight. Now, I've said in many of my videos that generally bishops are better than knights, and we should always value the bishop pair. However, white has a slight lead in development, and let's have a look at how Anish tries to utilize that. He plays e3, short castles and rook to c1. Gukesh takes and plays c5, and after Anish castles, he takes on d4. Now, here there's a well-known drawing line that has been played in many games. White can take with the knight, and after bishop b7, there's queen b3, knight c6, should defend the bishop, white takes here, here, and this is not the most exciting line in the world, and the players generally repeat here. All right, but Anish went for a different line. He played the move knight e4, hitting the queen, queen e7, a3, hitting the bishop, the bishop steps back to a5. And here, white can take with the queen on d4 to keep a symmetrical structure. And again, white has a slight lead in development, but black is generally considered to be pretty solid here, I believe, after the move rook d8. But Anish goes for a different concept. He takes with the pawn. And Gukesh plays rook d8, bringing the rook into the game. And Anish plays a very odd-looking move, rook to c2. Now, at first, this looks pretty innocuous, right? Like, what's really wrong with black's position? Black has the two bishops, and he has a better pawn structure because white has the isolated pawn on d4. However, it's a little bit difficult for black to develop. For example, if you play a move like knight c6, you always have to be careful that you don't get hit with d5 at the wrong moment. So, Gukesh plays bishop d7 first. Anish plays rook e2, bringing his rook over to the e-file. Bishop c6 and queen c2. And again, it feels like black should be completely fine here, but... It's not that easy to bring this knight into the game. Because if you play knight d7, you will get hit by d5. And if black takes, there's knight eg5, attacking the queen and threatening a checkmate on h7. So black is lost here. So knight e7 is not possible. If black plays knight a6, well here at least white can take and go into this position. Which is a little bit better for white because he has a better pawn structure here. Knight c6, an annoying threat. So again, it's very difficult for Gukesh to develop. So he just played the move bishop e6, and Anish plays rook f1, rook fe1. And again, this doesn't really solve any of the problems for Gukesh. Also, now that the rooks are doubled up on the e file, Anish is looking in some positions to go after the king. So Gukesh plays king h8, and his idea is to step out of this diagonal so that white does not have a move like knight eg5 and maybe a rook sec here. And so Anish plays knight eg5 anyway. Wait, what the frick? Takes and rook takes e6. Holy smokes. So he's sacrificing knight, now he's sacrificing a rook. Gukesh takes and Anish takes again. Now what is Gukesh supposed to do here? His queen is under attack. And the problem is if you move the queen, let's say here, white's going to take here. And there's not a good way to stop the checkmate on h7. For example, if you play queen g8, white has queen g6. And there's no good defense against queen h5 because white's also always controlling this diagonal. So very impressive stuff by Anish. Gukesh decides to take the rook. And now eliminate the knight. So his idea is like, okay, let me get rid of all of white's attacking pieces. But here Anish plays another amazing move. You would expect him to just automatically recapture on f3. But he plays queen f5 after some careful consideration. And his idea is to just to go after the king with this checkmate. Because the bishop always controls the g8 square. If black, for example, goes here, we can take on g5. Hitting the rook, hitting the bishop. And there's, again, no good defense. Black has a lot of material for the queen. He has two rooks, a knight, and a bishop. But... These pieces are not participating in the defense, and why she's absolutely crushing. So Gukesh plays bishop e4, trying to deflect the queen. Now Anish takes. Rook takes d4, hitting the queen and threatening a checkmate over here. So Anish plays queen f3. Threatening a checkmate over here, also threatening a nasty check over here. And covering the d1 square. 
So Gukesh plays g4, stopping queen h5 check. But now Anish gives a check. King h7, he gives a check. Now after g6, white can give a check again, and it feels like black is one way or another just getting checkmated. So Gukesh plays king up, and here Anish plays a very elegant bishop to c2. Stopping rook d1 check, and his idea is to go queen h8, pick up this pawn, and go after the black king. And there's nothing black can do. The best move here for black is to go knight c6 and give up the rook in the corner. And black's just completely lost here. So after bishop c2, Gukesh resigned. So an absolutely crushing victory for Anish Giri in round number two. A very tough stop for Gukesh, who starts with zero out of two. I'm sure he still has to find his footing in this tournament, and when he does, I, I think he will score some points as well. But why can't say it's a tough tournament? You play against the best players in the world, and there's still 11 rounds to go, right? Like, normally the tournament hasn't even begun yet. But yeah, many more rounds still ahead. But at any rate, I do think this will be a great learning experience for the young Indian prodigy. All right, so let's move on through to the next game. So we also had the game between Vincent Geimer and world chess champion Magnus Carlsen. So Carlsen yesterday made a draw with the black pieces, uh, sorry, with the white pieces against Lavon Aronian. Not a disaster, but not the best start either. And Keimer made a comfortable draw with black against Parham Maksud. Like perhaps he even had chances for more. So Keimer opens up the game with d4. And just like with Anish, it's always interesting what Magnus is going to do. Is he going to play a Nimzo? Is he going to play a Slav? Or... In this game, Magnus decides to play the Grunfeld defense with d5. Now, the idea to move d5 is to stop white from playing e4. If black plays bishop g7, white goes e4. And this is known as the King's Indian. But after d5, black is stopping that. And the idea is that, okay, white can take and play e4 anyway. But black will take. And even though this looks fantastic for white because he has the big center, Black is going to play bishop g7 and put a lot of pressure on white center. So this is really the idea of the Grunfeld defense. But Cameron goes for a different line. He plays knight f3, bishop g7, and bishop g5. The idea is to hit, take this knight and take this pawn over here. So Magnus jumps into the center with knight e4, putting pressure on this bishop and the knight. Now white should not be greedy and take the pawn here because this loses right away after e6 hitting both the knights. All right, but of course both, pl both players are know that. So bishop f4 was played takes takes and here a bit of a sideline by magnus i believe i had a game against wesley so in which i played the move c5 if i'm not mistaken and this leads to very dry type of positions white is hoping they had a small advantage in these end games after castles takes 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 which be two but i managed to draw without too much difficulty difficulty so maybe Keimer was hoping to go into something like this you know maybe where he can try to slightly press magnus but without too much risk but Magnus has other intentions. He wants to keep more play in the position, so he plays the move c6. Alright, e3, short castles, and Keimer plays the move queen b3, making it difficult for black to develop. The bishop cannot come out just yet. So Magnus plays bishop queen a5, sorry. And here Keimer probably made a slight inaccuracy. I think he should have taken on d5, and now play bishop b2. And again, it's not easy for Magnus to develop. He can go knight c6, castles, but you can't get this bishop out easily because you'll always hang the pawn on b7 so maybe you have to play b6 but now your queen is kind of off you know most like bishop b5 are already very bad for black because the knight's under attack the pawn's under attack so i think had Keimer played this I, I don't know what magnus would have done and white would have had a slight advantage but he goes bishop b2 right away and here magnus sees his opportunity to liberate his position he takes on c4 and now he develops a knight so he wants to go knight b6 attack the bishop and if the bishop moves bishop b6 and all of a sudden, black's pieces come to life. So Keimer played bishop g5 first, hitting this pawn on e7. But I think this was a little bit of a luxury. I think he should have just castled here, keep it very solid. Yes, black probably has a fine game after knight b6. And maybe moving out the bishop or like knight d5. But again, bishop g5 felt like a little bit, um, again, like a little bit of a luxury. So b5 played by Magnus attacking the bishop. Bishop b2 and rook e8, just defending the pawn on e7. Short castles and Magnus goes knight b6. So he wants to start taking controls, taking control over these squares on the king on the queen side, combined with the move bishop e6. Camera goes e4, grabbing space in the center, and now comes bishop e6, queen c2, and c5. Another fantastic move by Magnus. Again, putting pressure on that center. That's always Black's idea in the Grunfeld. d5 by Keimer, now bishop g4, putting pressure on the knight. And the pawn on c3 all of a sudden becomes pretty weak. So Keimer drops his bishop back, but now e6 again. We see the full display here of the Grunfeld defense. White, black gives white the center, but after that, black starts attacking it. And here, it's difficult for white to keep it all together. Rook a b1, c4, blocking the bishop and making sure that white never has the move c4 available 
to free his bishop. Pawn takes e6, rook takes, knight d4, we see the straight. But after move a6, it becomes clear that Magnus has a great position. This bishop on e2 is quite passive. The bishop on g7 is pretty active. The pawn on c3 is pretty weak. The pawn on e4 is kind of a target. And all of Magnus's pieces are, are active. And he has a very healthy pawn structure. Well, again, Keimer has some weaknesses. So this is not the position you want to find yourself in against the world champion. Keimer played knight e4, rook e8, and rook fe1. Knight e4 by Magnus. He's increasing the pressure, hit, putting pressure on pawn on c3. And he's also looking at this maneuver, bringing the knight to d3. Knight c6, queen c7, and knight b4. Keimer wants to put his knight on the d5 square. Knight c5, uh, sorry, knight d5, and queen c6. And already, black is putting a lot of pressure on this pawn on e4. Keimer plays bishop g5, but I don't know, maybe he just completely overlooked this move. Or he underestimated it. Knight e7 check. The idea is that if white takes, black just wins a pawn here. And I'd say this position is just lost. It's just lost. If Magnus has the position 100 times, I expect him to win it 100 times. Like, it's really that bad. So, Keimer gives a check. Magnus takes and plays knight takes c3. So, he sacrificed the exchange, but now he has these strong pawns on the queen side. And also, this knight on c3 is super annoying for white to deal with. Rook bc1 and a5. Magnus just starts pushing his pawns. And it's not easy to see what Keimer is going to do about the symbol b4. Maybe, you know, protecting the pawn on b4 once more, a4 and b3. So he brings his bishop back with bishop g5 and bishop d2, stopping the advance of the black pawns, but now Magnus brings in his rook, h4 and rook d3. Total domination. Keimer goes h5, trying to create some counterplay, but Magnus just doesn't care. He just takes the pawn. Now Keimer takes on c3 and goes queen e2. To be fair, Keimer does a pretty good job of creating some counterplay here. Magnus should not take on e1 because now white can take on d3 and all of a sudden white's back in the game because if you take and play d2 white has rook d6 at the end stopping the pawn and white's completely fine. So Magnus plays queen e5 first defending the rook and protecting the pawn on h5. Queen e8 check, king g7, rook e3, camera again trying to create some counterplay but h6 a very solid move by Magnus, queen e4 now we see a trade and b3 by Magnus. So he's finally setting his pawns in motion now Keimer takes here, Magnus takes on a2, and Keimer plays rook a4. He's just in time to catch the pawn, a, to catch the a pawn, but Magnus will get his exchange back, and he's just in time with the move rook d5 to defend the pawn on a5. If if black would not have this move, white would take here, and it would be a draw right away. But this position, it feels like it's lost. I mean, maybe, no, nah, I, I don't think anyone can hold this position even the computer i think magnus would probably beat the computer here he's up two pawns and you know he can always bring his king over it feels like there's just no chance here but let's have a look at how the world champion converts these types of end games rook a4 king of six king of one king e6 bringing the king over king e2 and now he goes rook f5 so his idea is to keep the white king pinned to the defense of the f pawn so then he can start walking his king over so camera goes f3 king d6 Rook c4, he doesn't want the black king to cross over. And the moment Magnus plays rook c5, he goes rook f4. So Keimer's de defending very tenaciously. Let's make sure, okay, if you move the rook over, I'm going to attack this pawn. Check, king e3 and king e6 by Magnus. But the unpleasant thing here for white is that he has to keep this a pawn under control, but he also has to make sure that, you know, black can also go after the g pawn. And that could also spell trouble. So Keimer goes here, king of 6 check, king g6. So Magnus is now setting his sights on the king side. Rook a4, rook g5, rook a2. They repeat the position once, and Magnus slowly but surely strengthens his position with the move f6, you know, one step at a time. g3, rook g5, and there's no good way to defend this pawn. So Camera goes king e3 and gives up the g pawn for the a pawn. Now, had his king been over here or here, this might be a draw, but due to the black play, due to the bad placement of the white king, black is just in time. Magnus plays h4, he sets his h pawn in motion. He wants to go h3. And there's no good way for white to stop it. So Keimer plays rook a8, trying to give a sneaky little check here in case white goes here. And white would all of a sudden just win the game. But of course, Magnus sees that. He goes king h5, stepping out of the check. And now the problem is that if you give a check, black can always go rook g5 to block. So king f2 was played, rook g6. Again, black said he was just to push this pawn down the board. And I don't see what white can do about it. Keimer give a check, but now Magnus just blocks. Rook a3, h3 f4 hitting the rook and the pawn on h3 but magnus comfortably solves both problems at the same time he gives a check and Keimer just resigned there's nothing white can do if you go king of three for example black just goes up 
there will always be a rook g3 check and h2 and white cannot stop the h pawn so really nice game for magnus carlson to get back into the tournament he moves to plus one now let's see how one of the winners of the first round did ding loren now you guys are in for a colossal game so you know grab your popcorn grab your drink and let's have a look at what happened in this epic fight between ding loren and parham maxulu so ding in this game plays the move 1e4 now as long as i follow ding's games he's always been a d4 c4 knight of three player so i'm a little bit surprised by this move and also because he has that world chess championship match coming up with Jan Pomniachi. so if he's planning to play e4 why would he give away give it away in this tournament right but anyway he opens the game with 1e4 and parham responds with e5 knight of three knight c6 bishop e5 now here in recent years the move knight f6 the berlin defense has become very popular but Parham sticks to his guns. He likes playing the line with a6, knight of 6, b5, and bishop c5. This is known as a neo archangels or neo archangels, whatever you guys want. a4, putting pressure on the pawn, so black plays rook b8, because white was threatening to take on b5, and black cannot recapture because your rook will be hanging. All right, so rook b8, c3, d6, d4, bishop b6. And here there's a lot of variations. The, the traditional main line has always been taking on b5. And playing knight a3 and black generally castles here and after takes either takes on d4 or plays bishop g4 right away but ding goes for the move a5 attacking the bishop now black should not take on a5 because here white actually sacks the rook takes an e5 and even though white is down in exchange here in the end game he has a crushing initiative this is a threat this is a threat hitting the rook hitting the king and the bishop so white's been winning back the material here. So Parham just slides his bishop back to a7, h3, short castle and bishop e3. The idea, by, the idea behind the move h3 is to stop bishop g4, but also the annoying knight g4 going after the bishop. Rook a8 by Parham to make sure that if white ever plays d5, the bishop is nicely protected. So rook a8, knight b2, and bishop b7. All right, rook e1 and rook e8. So everything looking pretty standard here. You know, you might think like, okay, we're going to have a slow real pass here. Uh, Ding is eventually going to try to bring his knight over. But Ding here went all out. He played the move knight g5, hitting the pawn on f7. Parham protected it with rook e7. And now knight de3. So his idea is to take an f7 and then bring in another knight to g5. For example, if black plays, I don't know, um, here, you can take a knight g5 and black is in trouble. So Parham plays h6. He's attacking the knight, and he is making sure that if white takes, there's not another knight g5 jump. So Ding takes on e5, and now it gets very complicated. Black should not recapture, because white will just take here, and black's in trouble. Because let's say you take out the rook, white will take here, deflecting the knight, and now you take an e5, and black's just getting crushed here. So Parham has to take on an e3, and that's what he does. Now here, white can recapture, but black's completely fine after he takes here, because there's nothing deflecting, you know... Uh, the knight from recapturing on e5. So Ding recaptures on f6 and Parham brings his bishop back. So we get this very crazy position where white is sooner or later gonna take here and black will have the two bishops for the rook but white will have some more pawns. So Ding takes on g7 and now Parham brings in his queen and also these black bishops over here look pretty scary especially if black can eventually get a rook on the f-file or maybe on the g-file. Ding plays the move queen e5 and with this move, he's making it clear that he wants to take the game into an endgame. Parham takes, stepping the king out of the, the out of the pin, and so Ding has to take. He takes, takes, and plays the move e5. And I think here Parham made a very instructive mistake. So if we have a look at the position, if we see that white has a rook, right? And black has two bishops, and white has some pawns. Now what Ding wants to do with the move e5 is open up files, so that the more files that open up, his rooks become stronger. So I think what Parham should have done is play the move d5. Keep the files closed. He can always put his king on e6. And again, I feel like black's minor pieces should be stronger here than the rooks. But he takes on e5 with a knight. And this really brings the rook to rooks to life. And after rook g8, Ding has the move g4. You do not play the move g3 because black takes anyway because the f-pawn is pinned. But g4, first of all, advances the king side and deals with the problem in a very nice way. Rook d8, rook a1, and rook d7. Parham does not want to allow rook e7 check. But now King's, uh, <laughs> King Ding starts advancing on the king side. If you take here, there's rook f5 check, and you lose the bishop, so you cannot do that. So Parham played c5. He wanted to set his own pawns in, on the queen side of motion. Check. 
king g7 and the other idea of the move c5 is that now he has this check over here but then keeps pushing on the board and again it's not clear to me how black is going to create counterplay on the queen side and in the meantime you know white's rooks are pretty scary you know maybe they can come to the sixth rank put black's king under pressure and he's just going to push the pawns so bishop c7 rook e6 now if you take here there's king h5 and the black's king the black king is really in a lot of trouble so bishop d5 was played hitting the bishop now here white should not try to be clever with a move like rook takes d5 because if black takes there's rook e7 but black gives this check first a little intermezzo and now he takes on d5 and black is fine all right so ding takes on a6 first parham goes b4 maybe trying to take here weaken up the c3 square uh c3 pawn and if you will pick up that pawn later he already has a pass c pawn all right king h5 ding keeps advancing bishop f7 and now here ding makes a very bold decision he gives up his rook for more pawns on the king side the point is that black should not take with the rook because here white goes rook a7 the bishop is pinned and white is just going to push this pawn and black will always end up in a completely lost endgame for example if black goes here white's just going to trade go a6 the bishop has to go back and now let's say trade here take an h6 the bishop is stuck defending the a pawn and so the king cannot stop three pass pawns on the king side on its own so that is why parham was forced to take with the king and give up another pawn on this side of the board all right parham takes and goes bishop e5 again he wants to go after the pawn on c3 ding plays rook c6 so both c pawns disappear from the board and it becomes clear that black has to defend here for a draw even though he's up a piece white has four pawns for the bishop and especially these pawns on the king side can become pretty scary so parham gives a check g5 rook d4 very good move by parham threatening a checkmate so ding steps back and now rook a4 and there's no good way to defend the pawn on a5 so ding will probably get three pawns versus the bishop on the king side but will it be enough to win rook c7 check king f6 a uh, king f8 rook d7 attacking the bishop so here parham has to make an awkward decision if he takes over here well now there's rook a7 and you are in a pin so you don't want to do that so you play bishop c3 king g6 and rook takes f5 and here probably ding pushed the wrong pawn he should have probably pushed the f pawn with the simple idea of f4 f6 and it's not clear how parham is going to defend if you give a check here king h7 and you know maybe you go back and then you start pushing the h pawn but not easy to figure out over the board ding was down to four minutes and he played the move h4 also looks very natural but now parham gives a check and again he plays this move rook a4 hitting the pawn on h4 so ding pushes it and now rook f4 making sure that the f pawn cannot push but this turned out to be a mistake apparently he should have played the move king e8 hitting the bishop and after something like rook d3 aha uh -huh, you start checking here and i guess white does not have a good way to get out of the checks for example if you go here check here check here check push push b5 again not easy to figure out over the board when your clock is ticking so rook f4 looks very natural now ding played rook d3 perhaps in an accuracy i think his rook is pretty active over here so maybe he should have just uh kept it there the problem is if you go g6 black will take and after h6 black is just in time with rook h2 pinning the pawn so that after g7 he can take and white does not have this but what ding should have done is attack the bishop and if the bishop moves here let's say uh -huh, there's always moves like rook c4 again like th this is not easy to figure out over the board so Rook c7 probably would have put Parham in a difficult spot, but it's not easy. But Ding played rook d3, bringing the rook back. Now Parham gave a check, king g6, and rook g7. King h6, and now rook c7. Parham is defending this game so well. He's defending the bishop, and again, he's making sure that he always has these annoying checks. Ding pushes his f on, but now rook c6. King h7, and rook c7 check. The king step back, check. King here, they repeated the position once. And finally, Ding plays g6, which seems to be the correct move. And Parham plays bishop f6, a good move, stopping rook d8 check, and also freezing the white king over here a little bit. Rook a3, rook c8, again, a good move by Parham, rook a6, and bishop c3. Rook a7, king g8, and now white cannot step forward easily anymore, so it becomes very difficult to white. The problem is that if you ever go king h7 here, black can always give a check. I think if white manages to achieve this, and rook c7 he's probably winning or like king h7 and h6 but he's just not in time so rook a7 king g8 
He stabbed the king back. That came a check. King g4. Rook c6. Another excellent move by Parham, making sure that there's no h6. And if you ever play f5, well, then there will always be a bunch of checks again. So rook d7, you know, making sure that black never has this move. So Parham went here. Check, check, check. Here. King g5. Check. King h6. Bishop f6. Again, it becomes super difficult for white to make progress. Rook f7 and Parham set with the move rook c6. He's defending the bishop. And already here, I don't see a good way for white to make progress. So ding one here. Rook d6, making sure the black can always block. Check, he blocked with a rook. If you block with the bishop, you're just going to lose the game. Because after f5, you're, you're just pinned. f6 is going to come. But Parham correctly evaluate the position. Because white cannot trade. Because the only move you have is someone like g7. And black will always pick up the pawn. So he went back. Rook d6, rook b7, rook d8. And again, there's nothing really that white can do. f5, rook d6, rook a7, rook d8. Here, rook f8 to defend the bishop. Bishop d8. And again, there's nothing white can do. So the players shuffle back and forth. And finally, this colossal fight ends in a draw. So Parham holds the line. He holds the draw. And Ding moves on to 1.5 out of 2 as well. I'm sure that Ding would have loved to win this game. Take the sole lead. But Parham's defense was too strong. And it was very difficult to figure out the win. At any rate... Let's have a look at what happened in some of the other games. The other games ended in a draw. We had a game between Noderbeck and Caruana, uh, between Wesley and Arjun, between Levon and Pragnananta, and between Jordan and Richard Laporte, which brings us the following standings at the round number two. Magnus Carlsen, Noderbeck at the Sartorf, Anish Giri, and Ding Loren are in the lead with one and a half points out of two games. Then we have Fabiano, Levon, Wesley, Prag, Arjun, Maxudlu, Jordan with one point. We have Rapport and Keimer with half a point, and Gukash with zero points, but I'm sure that he will score many points in the up and coming rounds. At any rate, I do hope that all of you guys enjoyed this recap. I'm about to lose my voice, and I look forward to seeing you all in the next one.